Good morning. All right, so for uh, Section 8, um, Section 8 is what I'm going to expect you to do for the, uh, for the Lab 3. I'm going to provide a solution files for the .cmd files and uh, the controller.v that you guys will need to continue to finish the assignment. Um, I was about to say, please don't distribute them to future classes, but I'll be working on Cadence Labs this summer, so hopefully we never used to have to use this, uh, this electric VLSI ever again. Um, it's not the up. It is, it is a tool. It is free, and it is worth what we paid for it. Um, so basically, what I, I want to kind of briefly go over the end of Section 8. There, there's only one example problem in here, and it's kind of talks briefly about electrostatic discharge uh, and how that can impact and why that impacts circuits. Um, I, yeah, I can, I can use that for, <laughs> you can turn that into me. Uh, I mean, Matthew, if you want to grade it, save me some effort. <laughs> 70. <laughs> Yeah, I was gonna say like <laughs> compared to what's typically, yeah, usually it's like it's out of a hundred, hundred twenty-five, two hundred, infinity. So we talked about the uh, the seven steps of uh, the synthesis plan. We kind of went over briefly floor planning and how that works and why that's important. Kind of being able to. Lay, lay out a cell. So when, you, when you're done with lab three, you're actually going to have a, this data path synthesized in the pad frame, as well as the controller, which you design with Verilog. So everything you learn will be combined into this final part. Um, so we talked about 13 signals and in, in the uh, multi-cycle data path. Uh, floor planning algorithm will accomplish the following task. Arrange the blocks on the chip, which we'll go into detail today. Decide the location of the I.O. pads. Decide the location and the number of power pads. I mean, we went to detail about this yesterday. Decide the location and clock distribution and the type of power distribution. So these are important numbers for you to know for the lab. This specific, uh, this specific in 0 0.6 micron like you guys are using. Uh, the size of the lambdas and how that translates to your different tech sizes. So floor planning, the general idea is that uh, the, you have a number of different blocks of the cell. Uh, I don't know why it's not <coughs> as dark as it could be here. Um, generally, so if you're wondering what's actually saying here, you've got block A. I'll move this over just a little. So you can compare both of these at the same time. So here you have these fixed blocks. Here's block A, block B, block C, and block F, and all, all of these different elements, right? And so you got to worry about how all out the interconnects, which is part B. So the flexible blocks A and C, the connector's position, and it's, this is what's often called a rat's nest. And so this is all the congestion that's going on. So you want to try to minimize this in a floor planning algorithm. So what ends up happening is that a lot of, and you see how you have this D out to B in here. So that's an example. It goes to E in. So a lot of, this would help out quite a bit if we simply just took this block for B, and instead of having VDD and ground running this way, we just flipped it. So that's what, so they described that here. They mirrored about the x-axis. And you see how it significantly cut that, just that one action significantly cut down on the, uh, on all the interconnects in the circuit. So that reduces the length of them, reduces the power, reduces the capacitance, all things that we studied early on. And so, you're kind of learning a lot about this, you know, bit slices and data paths. You know, typically, what you want to do at this level is you have a slice plan and you want the, you know, 
control signals to come in like this so that way you can minimize the you, you try to avoid having the control signals cross each other and this actually becomes incredibly useful as you're getting into stages so you can break them down into different stages and since you're breaking them down into different stages you can just have the controller go to the specific part of the bit slice and you don't have overlapping so that allows a better flow to the to the circuit So here, this is we're going to talk about slicing floor plaps and an abutment. The general idea of abutment is that you've got to put the cells directly next to each other without having to worry about routing. But when you're dealing with slicing floor plans, it has the property that composite cells, subcells are obtained. And so here you've got a cell with a set of composite subcells are obtained by a horizontal or vertical bisection of the composite cell. Slicing floor plans can be represented by a tree. So the, what's going on here is this tree is trying to come up with the minimum amount of space required to be able to have the <laughs> paths go through, right? And then we call this, for the, how many of you have taken algorithms or anything like that? Okay, so Demba has. So Demba, you, you understand the the concept of a minimum cut of a graph. For everybody else, you uh, want to, each of these paths in a graph has a what's known as a weight, right? So, you know, if you have six and two for whatever, you know, whatever measurement you're using. Um, a good example, if you're designing a finite state machine and you're trying to use it in a Coke machine, right? And so certain paths, you I take a certain path because it'll cost you 25 cents or this one's 10 cents. You need to be able to create that. Or you want to take the shortest path of the path of least resistance. So that's the value. So you want to cut, have the smallest number of edges or smallest sum of weights in this case. So here you, you have these all, but there's no real uh, connection to them. So how do you connect them all? I mean, you could go like this, but that's not ineffective. So what they're doing instead is they're actually figuring out how they break them down into four sections and then they go one, two, three, like so. And so what's the path? You can either traverse it this way or you can traverse it this way, right? And so it's one, two, three, or one, two, three. And the reason we do this is to deal with this concept down here called congestion analysis. So the whole idea here is you have these blocks. So you've got your data paths, your controllers, all, all these different elements that you've designed, right? And then you have your buses that go between them, right? So let's say we had designed an arithmetic logic <clears throat> unit here. And block F is our data memory. So in order to do that, we have to have the output that we calculate for the load store here, right? And then we get the value out, and let's say D is our registers for whatever reason, that has to go in here. So as a result, all of these different pa bus paths cause congestion. And so one of the things that we do in a place and route al algorithm, a floor planning tool, is congestion analysis. It's a determination of the real relationship between the cell placement and the required interconnect. And the measurement of the congestion analysis is known as routability. So that the routability of the channel is the relationship between the number of interconnects required to implement a specific layout and the channel capacity. So how many can you actually put in here? And then the die cavity is the space where you put it in. So the die cavity, and for those of you who've you know, looked ahead to lab three, that's when your pad frames are going to be outside of your die cavity. And so here is an example of how to improve some congestion analysis. So we have two logically equivalent cells, right? And see how C and A are different in these two? And so what ends up happening is based on the breakdown of the cell sizes, you can actually in, in, uh, in decrease the congestion and improve the routability of your cells, right? So if you're able to, if you long it out this way, in case you're wondering why 
your data path is in just a square and the controller is in just some smaller square, having the, the length that they do with the bit slices that, they, that you have improves routability by permitting easier communication of the control signal. Does that make sense? And so they did this with a concept called channel ordering. So you have to make sure that the specific blocks, let's say we had our control signal here and our data path here, they need to communicate, I'm sorry, our data path here, they need to communicate in a specific way. So when you have your program counter, you need to have the control signal uh, PC write condition come, to, come there, and then you have your memory, so you're going to have IR, IRD, I, IRD, and then you're going to have IR write here. And so you, you don't want them to have to cross everything. You don't want to be, you want to minimize these interconnects. And so in, you have to make the routing work here. And so the way you're going to do it is a kind of channel ordering. And so what's going on here is that we have to, we have three blocks. We have a block here, a block here, and a third block over here. So what basically what this diagram is saying is that we need to route this channel first. And the reason why is because you want to keep these smaller. And if you don't adjust it first, what's going to have happen is you route these channels and you can't adjust this. You're, it's fixed at that point. Whereas if you make this one adjusted first, I mean, these are still going to connect horizontally the same way. But if you bring these closer, then it's actually going to be a smaller area and you don't have to worry as much about uh, congestion, longer wires, which ultimately, as you recall, the power consumption is proportional to the length of the wire. And so we, I add these two definitions here about channel ordering as the process of assigning areas between blocks that are used for the interconnect. So kind of that process, I said, how do you actually order the channels to minimize area and reduce congestion and be able to still make it logically work and not have to worry about all the issues that we develop, developed with earlier. And so we, that actually uses this minimum cut slice tree. So make a cut all the way across the chips from the circuit blocks. I'm going to see an example here in a second. Um, continue slicing until each piece contains just one circuit block. And then each cut divides the piece into two without cutting through a circuit block. So what's going on there is this example. So if we have, we have these four blocks and the first line you cut through here, right? You gotta, you have, if you can go all the way from one side of the die cavity to the other, that's where you start. And so then you cut down this way, right? And you go through the routing channels like so. And so what's happening is we have this initial one here. We start out and then it goes through D, right? So we're defining D. So D is going to connect to this channel. So you're automatically just able to go to D. So then the next thing you need to do is you then make this right turn here. And then here, if you take this path, you can decide whether or not to do A or B. Right? And then you do this path instead, you get down here, and you're going to go do C or E. And so the cut number that's referring to right here, what that means is how many cuts do I have to go through in order to actually get there? So here's at one, that allows you to get to D. You go down here, you made your second cut, and you make your third cut here, right? So we have our one, two, three, and four. Or one, two, three, and four. And the reason why this is three is because it comes through here and you can go this way, so that's your third cut but you pass that cut to go to the fourth one. And so the reason why this is important is now you can actually rearrange this to determine the minimum cut tree in order to reduce your congestion analysis. So if for some reason this was split up, then you have to figure out which way you can travel to get to B faster. Does that make sense? So if let's say A was split into two pieces, and I need to get from D to B somehow. So 
make my cut line, and then I have another cut here. At which point I can go this way, or I can go here like normal, but then go like that. So what, it depends on what part of D you're in. So if you decide D need, you have to go from here to D, then you're not going to want to route it this way. You're going to want to route it that way. Does it make sense? So there might be a possibility where you would actually cut D into two pieces to say, all right, so the ones over here go to be this way, and the ones over here go to be through the other spot. You see how that works, that you're reducing the congestion. Otherwise, you're just, all of them are going through this one path. And so one of the uh, things we talked about in order to actually do this graph is something called a cyclic constraint. So we had a simple example here where there's a clear path all the way through the die cavity. So we don't have one here. So two goes to this, gets stuck here, three can go this way. And so that's where there's no clear slice across the cavity and ends up having a cycle, which means we have to actually worry about what we're going to do. There has to be uh, a different way. So you can either move the blocks until we obtain a slicing floor plan. So in this case, what's happened is we've moved it this way. So now there's two, right? And so you can start C to E or you can see how that works. Or allow the use of L-shaped rather than rectangular channels. So you would actually permit this kind of channel in your devices. Ultimately, you it's better to have a clear path because then you're not worried about, you know, all these other routing issues that come up. And so as you get towards the end, you have this concept of flattening. So you're merging polygons, and you guys are actually familiar with this now that you've worked on the AND gates and the ALU. So you start flattening everything. Uh, the process of merging polygons into a cell or multiple cells into a higher level of abstraction. So you start with AND gates, and then you get to at full adders, and then you get to arithmetic logic units. And then you, what you're doing is you're flattening them because you've done all your design and sizing constraints to make sure that you uh, can worry about logical effort, path effort, all that stuff. As we take care of that. It's like, okay, well, I've got all those calculations done. Now I've designed the cell. Now let's just move to the higher level of extra abstraction. And sometimes you want to do them all. Sometimes you want to, you know, only do part of it because you want to avoid some cyclical constraints in your floor planning design. So selective flattening is the process of merging flexing cells in order to create a channel cut to remove a cyclical constraint. So this diagram has an example here where you have a cyclical constraint, one, two, three, and four, right? No clear path. And so it ends up merging A and C this way, and then you can actually see there's a there's a cut here. So you can merge them using the selective flattening. You can cut them in pieces depending on what works better. So there's lots of algorithms, and there's people who spend their lives at companies uh, like TSMC or uh, basically or Intel or AMD figuring out better ways to do things like this. And it becomes tremendously useful, especially when you're getting into multiple processors and quad core and all, all this stuff. Uh, it becomes really useful to be able to make that uh, the communication efficient so that way you don't have any bot performance bottlenecks and you can improve the throughput of your computer. So I.O. and floor planning. So here you actually have a, you actually get a chip designed and then you're actually going to put it into the plan. So up to this point, we've worried about Everything we've done is tied into making one of these. So you can see you have your VDD and you have your VDD and ground, right? Your power supply, and everything connects with the with the logic. And so what we're going to do is you put everything into a chip package. So it provides a mechanical and electrical connection between the chip and a circuit board. So you put it into the circuit board, and every, you've ever dealt with circuit boards? You got pins, and you want to look inside. So that's what's actually going on there. You put the chip and it connects to the pins in certain ways. And that's why you have to put the pins in very, very specifically because, you know, you put, if this was your power supply and you hook that up to something else, 
and it's not going to really power the chip. So you have to be very specific about it. So going back to your electrical circuits classes, that's why they're very specific about having the pins in a certain way, um, which seems kind of intuitive, but now you know a physical understanding of it. So ultimately, you have little delay or distortion, uh, mechanical connection to the chip or the board, so you're actually able to put it in, uh, removes heat produced on the chip, uh, protects the chip from mechanical damage. So you actually, as you can see right here, in your PLCC, you can actually guard, guard the silicon using plastic. Uh, so you have 14 dip pin here. Uh, all of them, you can actually put them in different ways. You have FPGAs, uh, all these different, you know, all the FPGAs, they ultimately have this design. So here you see, um, let me zoom in here so I can show you what I'm talking about. So you've kind of seen this if you looked at the diagram. So you see you have your pins, and then you're actually going to go into the pad frame. So these are your, this is your pad frame here. And then you actually have your die cavity where you're going to actually have your CMOS logic. There. And so one of the benefits and the reason why uh, silicon continues to dominate, even though with all the different uh, emerging technologies, is that after you make one of these and you have all the algorithms figured out, you've done all the floor planning, you've done all the design, you've taken care of all your logical effort, you've made sure that all you've done your uh, PVT testing, all this, doing it again is really cheap. So then you can just mass produce them. So making 100 of them versus making 10,000 of them, the, the cost is very close. So it's the, the fore end is where most of the price is because they need people like you to do them. So people, people need that, so get yourself paid. Um, and so the pad frame is the organization of the metal pad into a ring around the periphery of the chip, which you can kind of see. So there's two ways to limit the size of the die. It, the pad limited die is determined, the number of pads determines the die size. And so you actually can put a chip into a pad, right? Or the core logic determines the die size. If you have a really small chip and you can just put it into a smaller pad. So you see here, this is a good example of a pad limited die because you see we have the number of pads that we need here and just a very small chip and you have these long wires that come out, right? So a core limited die would make this significantly smaller and have the all the pads here, right? There are pros and cons to each of these. The, 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 core, the pad limited dies are easier to mass produce. And it's not as though this is, this is not the size of a desk. This is going to be, you know, just a little millimeter, I'm sorry, uh, centimeter by centimeter sometimes. And so how do these pads actually work? It's a set of gold bond wires used to connect a chip to the package. So here you have some PMOS and NMOS transistors with the pad frame logic, which is different for each one because some of them are power pads, some of them are logic pads. So you have this bonding pad, which we'll describe down here in a second. Uh, so you have 26 micron, 260 lambda here. And so you deal with the pad logic and then you have your PMOS. This is actually a very, uh, don't know why I spent so much time describing the uh, diagram when it's pretty intuitive. Um, but here's the, what the bonding pad actually looks like. So you have the gold bonding wire connected to the metal. So you have your insulator and your oxide and your silicon substrate, just like a typical transistor. Uh, except it's the, instead of having your um, uh, gate source and drain, you just have this metal bonding pad which connects to these gold bonding wires. And so electrostatic discharge, this is part of the pad logic. Um, you have to worry a lot about you know, what happens when a person touches a chip and you don't want it to destroy the chip. So you have to worry a lot about ESD. So they have these specific diode clamps within electrostatic discharge protection circuit, uh, which limits the resistors and diodes large enough to sustain a significant current so let's say shock the circuit. And we're actually going to do a little problem here to give you some perspective on what kind of power, whenever you shock a circuit, what it's actually doing in there and why it gets damaged. But you have a current limiting resistor 
a some diode clamps here so you see that you know the circuit the current can flows this way, it can't flow that way. And then you have a couple of thin gate oxides into an inverter. So what's actually going on here? So this is example 8.2. Um, it's dictated by the functionality of the pad. So consider the charge on the human body discharged at a rate equal to 10 microamperes for one microsecond to a capacitor of 0 0.025 picofarads. How much voltage is applied? So we're going to use all the way back from 2.3. We have our time is equal to capacitance over current times voltage. So remember, that's our charge time. So what's going to happen is we rearrange the voltage just to T times I over C. So we have 1 microsecond times 10 microamperes divided by 0.25 picofarads and we get 400 volts so if you have a circuit where the uh, technology is supposed to be at you know 3.3 volts and then you suddenly for even a microsecond apply 400 volts it will fry the circuit which is why we have to worry about have these electrostatic discharge circuits in the power pads so these are actually important to preserve your chip Uh, power pads used for VDD and ground. I've said that a, a few times. So the power ring, uh, what's described here is that you actually want the power and ground to kind of go all the way around this frame so that way no matter where it's needed in, this, in the cell, it can be readily brought over instead of having to have long, one long power. Because uh, we were talking about how uh, the power wires and the clocking wires are the ones that especially when we get to modern technology, those are the ones that consume the most power. Um, so you want to do this circular pad frame to ultimately reduce the congestion and reduce the power consumption that you have, because that's the one that's steadily going. And so the power ring we find is running around the pad ring and supplies power to the IS pads only. Another set of supply voltage and steady state pads connects a second power ring that supplies the logic core. And so here, the, the corner pad, it's just a hybrid corner pad. You have IO pad, so steady state core limited IO pad, VDD pad rings. So you see how, how much design goes into the, uh, the pad design. You, you, all you need to know in this, in this class for right now is just that it's done. And uh, low power design, it can be very, uh, can be another field, or is another field. So, taking your bonding wire and putting it into the lead frame and connecting it with your power supply and then having it go into the ring that way. So the pad logic, I mean, this is just, we can walk through this really quick. You have supply voltage going to a buffer. You have a couple of inverters here. So your data out comes here, supplies the voltage, and then goes to the pad frame. We use an internal tri-state buffer to, to regulate it. So here we have our tri-state buffer, and then we have, when it comes back, we have an inverter, and inverter, so we have the inverter signal and the regular signal as well. So you, when you're having the output signal, you don't want to lose it. You want to create all your logic and then get here right when you need it, because this is at this point, this is useful for per people, right? So up to is like, you know, in class, CMOS, everything we've learned up to here is over on this side, but you actually need it over here, right? So you have to make sure that you can regulate the signal. And so this, you know, the last part of the, one of these, uh, uh, the, the synthesis is called tape out. So You've designed your chip, you've tested everything, you put it in your pad frame, you've got all your, you've laid it out properly, you know where your power pads are, you've created your power ring, you've done all this. So now you need to do the final set of verification tasks before the design database is shipped to Foundry. So the stages that you're going to need, uh, you're going to be dealing with all these. So DRC correct, which 
as you all know from your lab, is not as easy as one would like. Um, you know, getting 4,000 errors when often it's like one pin is off by a, one lambda and suddenly you get 400 errors. It needs to be functional. So if we were to send these chips off to Moses, which fabricates students, we, they would have to pass the DRC. Absolutely, otherwise they'll send it back. Um, here you've got layout versus schematic, which we, we've kind of gone over today. So for those of you who remember the uh, resume, and I talked about the things in the syllabus, things that you'll need to know. So that's what layout versus schematic is. So you design a schematic, you can do that in VHDL or Verilog, uh, but then you have to worry about actually breaking it down into the actual pad frame. You got to uh, worry about getting it in the die, you have to worry about congestion, you have to worry about uh, the m minimum cuts, you have to worry about all the things we've covered in class, and that is LBS, layout versus schematic. So there's all kinds of different uh, things. So uh, digital tape out, which is what we focused on quite a bit uh, in this course. Um, system on chip is kind of like a, a bit, you know, smaller ASICs or you're dealing with or, or RFIDs with analogs. Um, and then microelectrical mechanical systems. So MEMS such as you know, if you're using sensors for medical devices, accelerometers, gyroscopes, uh, use MEMS sensors to do that. So there's a whole tape out classification. And then you can deal with all kinds of other things. System on package, package on package, wire bound package, and flip chip package. We've done a lot doing our system on chip by actually physically designing it. But then you can take all of the actual you know, packages that you've built and put them on with other packages to augment current libraries. So you have your, your eLib that you've built so far. And you have it with all of your, and so you've modified it, you've added an AND gate, you've added a full adder, you've added an ALU, and you're putting all of these different cells in. So you have a package, but you want to modify the package so you can do it that way. So the three key things that, what do I need to learn in order to do okay in this class uh, and do well when I graduate? Chip assembly, which we focus quite a bit on. Uh, seal ring generation, which we're going to discuss a little bit here. And then you know, all this, you know, IP, chip ID, version ID, all this different stuff, and eventually actually physically going to that, you know, chip synthesis process that I showed you with the, uh, uh, at, at the beginning of the semester. So the seal ring is a structure to enclose the die and protects the die from moisture and sawing. So ultimately, you gotta, we got to protect these chips somehow. So that seal ring is done, and so when you actually need to cut the, the actual chips up when you have it on a, um, on a wafer, you need to actually indicate precisely where it's going to go. So the seal ring, which is what, where you put outside of the chip, so when you cut it, you have some room for error and it protects the actual chip. And so this is an example of a chip. You kind of zoom or zooming in here. Uh, you have the seal ring here. And so this is a pad, right? And these are the logics within the pad. So you have our pad logic output, but then you have to deal with the seal ring here. You see what I'm saying? Okay, so what are the actual uh, tape out tasks? So we only got a few more of these DGOs in this section. Um, equivalence checking. Does the logic actually do what, you're, what you want it to do? So you have to check at the different levels. You have Verilog, so here we're talking about Verilog and VHDL uh, and mixed netlist. So when you, you, know, you use Verilog and you generate a .cmd file or you're using polygons like you did with your AND gates and full ladders to generate the CMD file, there needs to be some sort of equivalence checking sign off. Does did what you design at some one level still work at the other level? Did your generated netlist actually do what you want it to do. And so then we have to worry about clocking and power. You know, we, we talked about layout and we talked a lot about how do we make sure that our clock trees and our power trees do everything we, that we, we said. You know, domain checks or we had different voltage domains you have to make and it's one is dependent upon the other. You have to make sure that the circuit that has the voltage domain subsequent is less because you want to make sure that you hit the uh, voltage, the uh, V in and VI, high and low, your noise margins. And then 
your uh, design for test insertion checks. So what's going on there, and we'll cover this a lot in section nine next week, um, you, there, are, there are circuits that you actually use specifically to produce test cases, and you use them to test your circuits. And so the other two things we have in here, timing and sig uh, signal integrity sign-off, uh, used it at uh, PVT design corners to check up set up and hold time like we, we calculated in section five. How do you actually do that? Does it actually meet those? And then power sign off used to validate active power budgeting to check dynamic power consumption and average power consumption across all timing corners. And so 8.32 voltage drop sign off, testing for static IR drop, multi-voltage analysis, multi-mode voltage and boundary scan mode. So in, in the next section, we're gonna be going into uh, what boundary scan actually is. Um, but basically all you're doing is making sure that when you have some sort of voltage drop, whether it's resulting in current drop or how, how far can you go to actually make, will the circuit actually still work? So. And so these are actual cases where they're actually looking at how the circuit works under certain, uh, if you have an eight millivolt max, max static drop, so you actually have, how, this is what the circuit looks like, and you can actually see the actual drop in voltage based on it. So where does, where does some sort of difference with the power input impact the circuit in different places? Does that make sense? And then power map, where, where, where a circuit's consuming power in any given moment. And then they're just basically measuring those. And then I think this is the, okay, so that's 8.35 is where we end there uh, for this section. And I'm gonna, uh, after 8.35, I'm gonna dismiss you guys. We're gonna do section nine just next week. I want you to focus on getting your labs taken care of. Um, I'm going to extend the lab three until when, this Wednesday, it's not gonna be Monday. Um, and I will make, uh, solutions available uh, for, for lab two so that way you can use those so that way you don't have to worry about uh, your previous stuff not quite working. Um, I will be reading your uh, challenges sections very thoroughly for this particular lab um, and uh, they, I will use them. They, you know, I'll, I'll see what you guys did in terms of actually using the electric VLSI to get as close as you can. My goal is, did they actually put in the effort? Is it tangible and visible? And then I go, okay, what's wrong with it? Did they identify what was wrong with it? If you identify what was wrong with it in the challenges section, I'll be able to go, all right, that's how I can demonstrate you had knowledge because you might not have been able to get it to completely work, but you understand why it didn't. And to me, that's just as valuable and great. Does that make sense? Though if you did get it to work, even better. <laughs> Which I'm guessing that's judging by the, yeah, no one. You're like, yep, I can be able to do. <clears throat> All right, so then you go uh, physical verification sign off. You do your DRC check, your layout versus schematic check, electrical rule checks, soft verifications, and comparisons using XOR gates on the on this boundary scan, and then mask layer integrity checks. And then, last but certainly not least. Uh, 34 and 35 here. We really didn't get into yield at all at much in this course. So I'm just saying that there's this idea that you have to uh, worry about yield in fabulous design houses such as us because we have tools. We, get, we don't have actual chips. Uh, so you have to worry about electromagnetic interference signals used to drive changes in the clock tree to determine if any electromagnetic interference affects the board design. And then lithographic simulation and verification across the process windows, how does it actually work? Uh, chemical, mechanical planarization, which if you want to really go into detail on this, uh, you can become a chemi uh, chemistry major. Or And then uh, paramet paramatic yield analysis. Uh, the whole idea there is, are you actually getting your outputs where you need them to uh, out be output based on the physical de design of the chip? And so the, uh, in this section, um, 
when, I, when we do the take home exam, section eight, uh, the two example questions, I'm not gonna have anything like that on the exam. I'm just gonna kind of have these, you know, a few definitions, uh, probably something along the lines of what are the stages of physical verification sign off? Um, uh, what would be a good type of thing? Just, you know, tape outs only that, not the whole description. Um, I may ask you to define, like, define tape out or uh, describe uh, what's, what's 8.21, I believe, define and describe what a bonding pad is. So you just do that and include the drawing. That's a kind of a basic one. Uh, here's a good one. The chip package, 8.16, that's a good problem. And then... Uh, Floor planning, 8.3. 8.2 or 8.3, I'll decide. So no, uh, there's not going to be any questions in the section three about about section in, about section eight from class. Does that make sense? I think that's fair. Because uh, I want to spend the next uh, two lectures digging into testing. And uh, we'll be describing something called a D algorithm, uh, which generally, what happens when you have, oh, that drawing didn't happen. Uh, what happens when you have a set of, you know, multiple circuits, and you here you're getting the right value, but here you're getting the wrong value, and can you find something called a stuck at zero fault or a stuck at one fault? So a stuck at zero fault is going to obviously, it, you know, affect AND gates all the time. But it, you may not necessarily be able to tell if you're getting, you know, a zero or a one on the input of the other uh, wire for an OR gate. So there's all kinds of different things. So, so the D algorithm, there's a basic way to do it, and then there's the D algorithm, which is the proven way to always catch it. So on that note, um, unless anybody has any questions for me, uh, you're free to go.